with me in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 14, and then we'll pray. Joshua chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 6 through 14 this morning. God rewards those who continue to endure and persevere. When you get there, give me a big, healthy amen. Joshua chapter 14, verse 6 through 14. Remember, I'm waiting for an amen. That's to let me know you're there. All right. Thought I was going to have to come down here and help you. But I would have been all right with that too. Let's pray. Father God, in the blessed name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for redemption for forgiveness. We thank you for power and victory. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We're asking today for a double dose of the Holy Ghost. Empower us in this word today that it may, not normal, but radically change our life. That it impacts us in such a way that we can't help but make a difference everywhere we're at. Be with the less fortunate, God. Be with those that are struggling in their life and having trouble that just can't seem to get over on the other side, that can't seem to find a consistent way to live and to live peacefully and joyfully even in the midst of struggles because life is a struggle at best. And it's inevitable. There's no way to get away from it. They're coming. But it's how we handle them. It's how we process them. Holy Ghost, take charge of this message. Give the people of God the revelation, the impartation, and the illumination of God's Word and their understanding that they would never, ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen and a glorious hallelujah. As T.D. Jake says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Look to your neighbor and ask him, are you ready? Joshua 14, beginning in verse 6, and the Bible says, a delegation from the tribe of Judah led by Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, Remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave from my heart a good report. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people and discouraged them from entering the promised land. For my part, I followed the Lord my God completely. So that day, Moses promised me the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your special possession and that of your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord your God. Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise, even while Israel wandered in the wilderness. 
Today I am 85 years old. I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey. Can you imagine? And I can still travel and fight as well as I could back then. So I'm asking you to give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts, we found Anakites living there in great walled cities. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land just as the Lord said. So Joshua blessed Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and gave Hebron to him as an inheritance. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Give God praise and glory in this church house. What an amazing story. The interpretation of Joshua 14, 6 through 14, after much study from the Hebrew and the Greek, from Latin to Aramaic to the English vernacular, I've covered this particular passage several times over my years of preaching the word and some evangelizing. The first on this list is the tribe of Judah. The men of Judah led the armies of Israel, and they were the largest and the most powerful army in all of the land. They were boasting with some 76,000 warriors in their company. What an army. Can you imagine coming up to battle against such a group as this. And they were all fighting warriors. They wasn't just in the army like today. It wasn't some were skilled and some wasn't. They were skilled beyond measure. They were warriors, and they were all classified as warriors. They all knew how to fight. Not only how to defend, they knew how to take charge. They knew how to go after the enemy and put a stop to them. Before giving the territorial boundaries, the Spirit of God records the noble requests of Caleb for the city of Hebron. Somebody give me an amen in this house. We want to amen, we want to praise him. We want to receive what God has for us today. If you've given him something for him to inhabit during praise and worship, then right now the only thing left is you receiving the power of this word and a double dose of the Holy Ghost. Though Caleb was then 85 years old, Caleb's faith, his courage, and his strength were absolutely unabated. Unabated here biblically means that his faith, his courage, his strength was absolutely without reduction or intensity. It was powerful. He was as powerful at 85 years old as he was at 30 years old when called to spy on this land. Can you imagine? You look at people today that wish in their 70s and 80s they could go back and live their youth of 30. This is a man that lost no spiritual fervor whatsoever. What was the secret of his amazing success 
it's not time for me to answer it. But what God done for Caleb, God can certainly do it for you. He's not a respecter of person. He's a respecter of faith. And faith is dead if it's not accompanied by action. It's powerless. You can talk about faith, but if you don't put faith to work, it ain't faith. And in this world we're living in today, you better be supplied with faith. You better be stocked up with it. You better be walking it, talking it, breathing it, eating it, living it. Because your total dependence on living a successful life, even against all hell and all opposition, is your faith. And without faith, you cannot follow God wholeheartedly. Caleb was as consistent in these 45-something years of following God day after day after day wholeheartedly as he was at the beginning. He never lost his spiritual edge. The tenacity, the stick to the fortitude, the hanging on for dear life and not letting go was Caleb's life along with Joshua. Shout a big hallelujah right now. If you want to experience that in your life, give him praise, glory, and honor right now. Caleb longed for more spiritual conquest and received Hebron for his inheritance. Hebron meant not only the city, but the entire country around it as well, according to verse 12 of this chapter. The city had been conquered earlier by Joshua in chapter 10. It later was given to the priests, but Caleb kept the surrounding region for his inheritance. Caleb had been spared from the plague that took the lives of the unbelieving spies earlier in Numbers chapter 14. Joshua and Caleb had been preserved during the wilderness wanderings because of their undivided devotion and loyalty to God Almighty. God watched over them throughout the 40 years of wandering in the desert. Now you want to talk about two people who could have complained God, we're the ones that agreed with you that even against these fierce giants, we can take this land. Why are we having to suffer along with these morons just because they're afraid and because grapes was the size of basketballs? And they had to be carried by multiple people on a vine. They were too big and heavy for one person to carry. Grapes. God watched over them throughout the 40 years of wandering in the desert. They remained loyal and steadfast to God every single second of every minute of every hour of every day without wavering in their faith. They showed the people an example that was unquestionable while they still whined and moaned and griped and complained, the people of Israel. They still remained loyal and steadfast to God day after day after day. God kept their clothes and their sandals from wearing out. God kept them healthy and well-fed during this entire detour of year after year after year. 
I mean, we're talking 40 long, long years over someone else's mistake, over someone else's disloyalty, over someone else's discredit, over someone else's rebellion against God's word and his authority. While the others were famished, moaning and groaning and whining and dying out all these 45 years, Caleb and Joshua still had a positive attitude, an uplifting outlook on life. even dealing with their turmoil. It makes our insignificant little problems look very minute in comparison. It makes us think, my God, what's wrong with us? I can tell you what it is, but don't think I'm cussing because I'm not. It's because we're full of hell. That's exactly what it is. Heaven don't promote such things as this. Hell does. Heaven don't murmur, whine, and complain, and grumble, and stumble about everything that don't go their way. That's not benefits of heaven. That's hell's categories. And ourselves. Sometimes hell can't even get in the picture because we're in the way. Are you getting this? Amen. While all the others who were disobedient to the word of God struggled and griped and complained, whined and moaned all the time, woe is me, wah, wah. And you know what Joshua and Caleb done? Caleb is an unsung hero of this Bible, an amazing man of God. But not one time do you see recording where Caleb mocked and laughed and ridiculed him. Boy, we would have. You whining sissies. I'm here because of you dummies. You're getting what you deserve, ha ha. Look, your sandals is falling off your feet. Your toes are all jacked up. My sandals still look like new 45 years later. He never done it. He walked in power and victory. He understood the situation. Caleb was like the men of Issachar who threw hell itself in the most terrible times of the season. The men of... The high baby doll, the men of... Oh, oh, hi, buddy. Papa loves you. I'll be done in a little bit. All right. Like the men of Issachar who understood their times when nobody else could figure anything out, Caleb understood the time and the season in which they were in. He understood the whining and complaining and he even understood fear. He just didn't give in to it. They surrendered to it. And it cost them 40 plus years of wondering. And if you read the story, even from Genesis and on until the Joshua, you'll see where they would start to do better and they'd be puffed up in pride. Then some wouldn't go their way, and they'd whine, moan, and cry. God would tell Moses, tell them, keep walking around the mountain, and here they'd go again. Forty-plus years of this. Because of a bad attitude, 
I'm telling you, your attitude will absolutely make you or break you. It'll either compliment you in this life, and sometimes it's tough at best. But if you got the joy, Nehemiah said in the hardest time of his life, and I believe it's Nehemiah 8 verse 10, Nehemiah said, for the joy of the Lord is my strength. Give him praise. So what does it mean? It means that during hell itself, if you can't jump up and down and shout victory and praise God, your life sucks. That's exactly what it means. If you can't get into this word, if you cannot get into this word, and encourage yourself when life is trying to get you down and out, you can't encourage anybody else. If you can't get into this word and target your problems, then you can't help anyone else. It's a love letter for you. that will help you in anything you could ever go through in life. Read it. Study it. Learn it. It's for your benefit. It's not just lost people out there losing in this world. It's Christians that are giving up their place and surrendering back to the antics of the enemy and falling back into the ways of the world who have tasted the gift of God, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and then have abandoned their faith as to never be brought back again. Joshua and Caleb also had survived several years of war in Canaan, Caleb knew that God would not have kept him alive, promising him a reward for his faith, only to give him over to the Anakim. Now remember that Anakims were described as giants and descendants of Anak who lived in Canaan near Hebron in the southern part of the land. Robert put them up. Now I want you to look at the screen. This ain't a cartoon. This is what they were dealing with in Canaan. This were the giants that Joshua and Caleb came back and said, with God's help, we can take them. And remember what God told them? I'm giving you the promised land. Right now, some others have taken it over, but I'm giving you the land. Go in and take it from them. And they came back, 12 spies. Caleb and Joshua came back to Moses and gave them the report. They're giants. Their food, their grapes are bigger than your head. They're massive. Food, delicious, milk and honey. But with God's help, we can take it from them. And the rest of them seized the three million in company in fear. No, it's too dangerous. There's no way we can take it from, look at that. We can't take it from them. They'll destroy us. They'll wipe us out. And fear seized and paralyzed the whole company. And they refused the Lord thy God. The whole time, Joshua and Caleb saying, now I mean, look at from the waist up, the exterior, the length, and they short legs, but powerful muscle. Their feet was as big as some's bodies. There's a reason to fear. There's a reason to be afraid. But listen to me. 
If you can't conquer your fear, you'll never have victory in life. Sometimes fear can be a motivator. It's not, listen, I don't care who says they don't, they're a liar. Everyone has a certain amount of fear about something. I know guys that I've rode with back in my older days. I mean, fought anything that walked, talked, breathed, or anything else. But let them go to the doctor and then pull out a syringe with a needle and they fall apart. Well, uh, you ain't sticking. I mean, I've seen it. I've been, you ain't sticking that in me. I can't do shots. Oh, no. And I'm like, you are joking, right? No, I ain't joking. Everyone has fear about something. It may be a spider, snakes, or anything. You may fear your little woman because you know she may kick your butt. <laughs> It's not that we may have fear. It's what you do with it. It's how you process it. It's how you handle it. And I'm telling you something. When you work through your fear, whatever it is, it strengthens you. It empowers you. It gives you something to be proud of. And I don't mean in arrogance. I mean that you've accomplished something that life tried to suck you into that life tried to get you to give up, to give in, to quit, and you didn't, and you didn't. They came with a report from their heart, and they said, we saw them. We saw the Anakim, and they're right. They're big. They're big. And so is the meals, the food, the fruit. Everything is big and luxurious and oh it's awesome but god said we can take the land from them and i choose to believe god we can take the land and have victory and the rest of them pulled mutiny and refused and they wandered in the desert now if you remember the story they wandered in the desert for 40 plus years as they died out the whole time and if you'll remember, the last time when God said, enough is enough, I'm done with these rebellious people, what did God tell Moses to go tell him? Here's what God told Moses to go tell him. Tell them that every person that is 20 years and older will die face down in the desert dirt. And everyone who is 19 and younger wasn't born in this generation. They were born out of the next. Every one of them will enter the promised land. And every one of them died that were 20 and older that never entered, all because of their attitude, their rebellion. But Caleb, the unsung hero of the Bible, stood strong. Even in these 40 plus years, not one time did he say, I told you so. He looked at him with sympathy. We could have taken the land. And he didn't tell them, you brought all this on yourself. He just knew it in his heart. They're suffering immensely because of their rejection and because they didn't believe. Listen, their actions chose for them to say, God, you're a liar. We don't believe you. If we go in there, these will kill us. We're not doing it. You either believe God to be the truth or God to be the lie. You either believe God is the right one and the devil is the wrong one, or you believe the devil is right and God is wrong. There is no in-betweens, folks. There is no in-between. So what if they were giants? They were on his land, and God said, 
Caleb come back and told them, we will drive them out by the strength of God Almighty because God said we would possess the land. Caleb, listen to this. Here, here's the key. Caleb saw things through the eyes of faith and not as they appeared outwardly. He didn't look at the symptom. He didn't look at the situation. He looked at it through the eyes of faith and said, by God, we'll take this land because God said it, that settles it to the amen, give him glory in the house. This was the secret of his abiding strength and amazing success. In all his major difficulties of life, Caleb never, and I mean never, wavered in his faith concerning God. He was truly a born-again, spirit-filled Christian saint of the Most High God. Give God praise and glory. They were living in the absolute favor of God. Praise him one more time. And what a place to be in. He was also not about to retire, although 85 years old, until he had accomplished and possessed everything that God had promised him. God honors those who continue to endure and persevere, who don't give up, give in, or quit. This story recounts one of the truly unsung heroes of the Bible, Caleb. He and Joshua being a part of this group that Moses commissioned. And listen, the instructions were given like this. Go and spy on those in the land of Canaan. God is giving us that land. Go see what it's like, who they are, and come back and report. Now, why did he do that? So they could put a strategy together on how to accomplish it because God said they will take the land and they were going to take it by force. Now, you want to talk about an actual David and Goliath. But when God says it, that settles it. You either believe God or you don't. When this group had returned, two out of the 12 was walking in the promise of God and the commission of God and the favor of God. The others instilled fear into the crowd. They were absolutely paralyzed by fear that they couldn't even handle their own selves. In the end, the Lord punished that entire generation with the exception of Caleb and Joshua for refusing to follow his word and enter the land that he was giving them, that he told them, I'm giving it to you. What was the secret to Caleb's spiritual success and longevity? He never lost his spiritual fervor. Not one time. I mean, not one time did he blow it. Not one time did he give in. Did he give up? Did he throw in the towel? Did he throw his hands up? Did he give in or quit? He stayed consistently blessed and highly favored of the Lord throughout his entire life, even in the midst of what others saw as turmoil. Verse 8 of this chapter gives us further insight of this unsung hero. He followed the Lord wholeheartedly. He fully and completely obeyed God throughout his entire life. As a result, he finished well in the race of life. In other words, Caleb fought the good fight. He kept the faith. And he finished the race. My God, give him praise for enduring and persevering. I will be quickly on this. There are three major lessons here for our benefit that we can learn from Caleb's life. 
to accomplish our duties to God, to be highly successful, blessed beyond measure, and highly favored of the Lord thy God in all that we do. If we stay consistent day after day after day, just like Caleb did. So what does it take to fully follow the Lord wholeheartedly without wavering in faith or questioning the situation? Three factors, three PowerPoints right now, and I'm going to give them to you quickly and we'll close. Number one, you will not compromise what you know to be true. If you're writing it down, you will not compromise what you know to be true. Caleb refused to go with the majority opinion. When it contradicted what he knew to be the will and the word of God, he absolutely was not about to give in or give up. He recognized that he had to seek God's approval over man's no matter, no matter what, no matter the cost, no matter the consequence, no matter that he was going against all opposition, he followed God wholeheartedly, give God praise in the house. Number two, you will take God at his word and you will stand on it. You will take God at his word and you will stand on it. God said it, that settles it to the amen. Give God glory in the house. Even though he was outnumbered by so many, his report was definitely not popular. He stood his ground no matter the cost, no matter the price. Caleb had endured 40 years of desert wandering. Because he, could not enter the promised land, not because of anything he'd done, but because of a group of dipsticks who rebelled against the authority of God. And they whined and cried and moaned about everything. And yet they wandered for 40 years along with a rebellious group. Yet Caleb never doubted God's ability to carry out through all, any of his promises. In spite of everything that happened, Caleb still trusted God completely and wholeheartedly. Give God praise. And the last lesson here, lesson number three, is you will desire fellowship and communion with God at all times. A desire is something you long for, you're excited about, you can't wait to receive it, to apply it. You will desire fellowship and communion with God at all times. Caleb remained faithful to the very end. He understood the truth behind the verse. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Do you have a praise left for God this morning? Then praise Him like you mean it. Give it to Him. They finished well in this spiritual race. They maintained a committed level beyond human reasoning, a close relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. When your love for Jesus is strong and confident, the spiritual distractions of this world will look less and less attractive to you. May we, like Caleb, be able to say, I am as strong today as I was when the Lord called me to his service. Give the Lord thy God praise in the house. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Romans 1.16, the Bible tells us, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God 
for the salvation of everyone who believes. And John 3, 16, the most popular verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. God's unconditional love for you that allows us to repent of our sins, to mend and change our ways, and to accept the sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross for your sin and my sin. And if you would like to make heaven your new home, you are but a prayer away of making this happen. If this is for you this morning, let us pray. You can pray out loud or to yourself, but pray after me. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I repent of everything I have ever done wrong. I open up my heart and my, and my life, and I invite you to come in. I surrender to you as my Lord, and I confess you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. With every eye closed and every head bowed, if you prayed that prayer while Brother Darren is coming down to close us in prayer, I want you to raise your hand right where you sit and let me know that you made Jesus the Lord of your life and you made heaven your new home. I see the hand. I see it. Amen. Glory to God. You may look up here. Folks, I hope you've been blessed today. I have been blessed by preaching the Word of God, which has been nothing but power and victory. There's no way you can't have the same thing Caleb did. There's no way you can't be mightily successful and highly favored of the Lord if you keep your faith and you use it. And you don't let fear consume you. Perfect love drives out fear. You let the love and the power of God drive fear far from you, and you trust God. If God said it, that settles it. God will never send you anywhere that he will not allow you to overcome and to conquer because you are more than a conqueror through him who loves you and called you according to his purpose. Amen. God bless you, church.